Eagle Communications is your complete business solution with options to fit any budget. We provide business class phone with customizable features and fast, reliable internet. Your knowledgeable team at Technology Solutions has a broad base of IT services to meet your needs. Let the experts at Marketing Solutions get your message to the right people on the best platforms. Eagle Communications will build your personalized business plan. Call us at 877-61-EAGLE. Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching. Thanks as always to the producer of our series, Brandon Cooley. We are in the studios of Eagle Community Television with Fort Hayes State University Athletic Director Curtis Hamakey as we talk about uh, sports and uh, a fundraising effort that's underway now and also a kind of a review of the Tiger Auction in our community connection. Well, Curtis, we can't start off unless we start with the football team and the 7-0, yeah. and 100 years. That's a long time. That's a lot of years, you know, and it's been an amazing start to the season. You know, you go back through the annals of time, and, and uh, football has been something that's been hard to establish a tradition through the years. We've had a great tradition with basketball and, and with other sports, but football has had its moments. There's been times in, in history where we've been pretty strong, but um, this has certainly been a trendsetter. Tell me about uh, the playoff situation. Uh, I mean, now, I guess Coach Brown and such, uh, looking at uh, potential there, even yeah. though they always tell the players, let's don't think about that. Well, you know, you start out with the goal of winning the conference championship, and that's been hard in this league for a number of years. Uh, primarily, um, you know, you look at nor what Northwest Missouri, the dominance mm -hmm. they've had at a national level in the last, you know, several years. And so, there's, a, there's several other really good teams in the league as well. So the, our, our conference schedule makes up our entire football schedule. So there's no non-conference games. And so you have 11 really, really tough games. And so to start out 7-0 and is nothing short of amazing. I think the job Coach Brown has done to date has been phenomenal. You've seen incremental steps that he's taken since taking over the job going, you know, from four and seven to five and six to six and five and seven and four uh, and then eight and four and winning a bowl game and, and so the, the steps have led to this moment to where they've gotten out of the gate with a seven and zero start and uh, like you said the first time in a hundred years and you know last two years we've, we've made it to a bowl game but uh, just to clarify at, at the division two level you know your first goal of course is the conference play and then trying to get into the playoff system, mm. which is, is very difficult to do. But if you don't make the playoff system, kind of a, a secondary prize is an opportunity to play in a bowl game if you fall short of making the playoffs. But right now, what our goal is, is to make the playoffs themselves. And w the country is divided into several regionals. And so we're in a regional um, that has, we'll, ha we'll select seven teams to go to postseason play. And, and our region is comprised of three or four other conferences. And then we'll, we'll be in the top seven, hopefully, when, that, when the dust all settles of that. Right now, I believe we're setting third in the region. Um, and so the top seed will get a bye in the first round. And then two, three, and four will all host um, five, six, and seven. So that's our goal right now is to make the playoffs and, and uh, be the first time since I think 95 that we've made the playoffs and, and uh, we're looking to do that and we've got you know a tough slate of games left to, to go to do that. But that's what we're trying to accomplish and I think sometimes we get confused with Division I because they do the bowl games as part of their playoff structure this day and age to where ours is not. The bowl game is separate from the playoff structure and it's kind of a byproduct of that. So our first goal is to make it into the playoffs, and that's what we're trying to do now. Um, with the remaining games that we have, they're going to be critical in terms of us having that opportunity the f for the first time in several years. And who makes that determination of playoff teams? Is it basically win-loss, or yeah. how does that work? Yeah, basically win-loss, and it's a regional selection committee. So uh, basically in our conference, I mean, you could lose one, maybe two games and be in the picture for a regional bid 
to go to the playoffs. Um, so right now we don't have any losses, but we still have to play Northwest Missouri. We still have to play Emporia State. Um, this weekend, of course, we play um, Missouri Western. Um, all tough games, but uh, if we can continue the, the progress that we've made to this point, then we should be in a pretty good position to host that. And what that would lead to, if we're a high enough seed, is potentially another home game at, here in Hayes. The uh, support for Fort Hayes State Athletics in all areas is certainly strong, based on the Tiger Auction, uh, yeah. which actually began, what, what this was the uh, eighth, eighth? I think the eighth, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, new location this year. Right. Played out well. Yeah, it really did. We, you know, we've gone the first seven years where we held it in the ballroom of the Memorial Union, and that had a seating capacity of about 450. I think we stretched that to about 460 some a few times. But uh, we started looking at that whether we wanted to try to expand and, and look into a different scenario, and and uh, we looked at going to the indoor facility, which is a natural because it is an athletic facility. Um, obviously, seating capacity there is is not an issue. And so we, we were able to get that up to nearly 600 um, rather than 450. So our attendance was higher, um, a great venue. It really worked out well. We had to pump in air conditioning. We were worried about that because that facility is not air conditioned. So And doing it at the end of August uh, was risky. But that worked out pretty well, not quite as well as we'd like it to, but there are some things we can tweak moving forward to make it even better. But for our first time over there, it was very well received. It was a great atmosphere. Um, accidentally, the sound system in there is outstanding because acoustically, with the turf on the ground and the insulation on the walls, it's very, very clear. So that was not designed by on purpose for that. Those are there for other reasons. But it did uh, create great acoustics for the sound system in there. And that's a big part of the auction, you know, and I think that went very, very well. So. By and large, it was the best auction we've had overall, and I think um, something that, with some minor adjustments moving forward, it'll be better even than that in the future. Well, and Curtis, a record uh, amount of money raised, too, according to University yeah. Relations, $240,000. Yeah, yeah, we've been close to that. We've been around two hundred dollars to two twenty-five dollars mm -hmm. every year, you know, so it's been a good shot in the arm for athletics. And that came about several years ago when we were in, you know, dealing with some budget cuts mm -hmm. from the state level and we just needed to replace some of that money and it became something that was not only we, something that we'd like to do but something we needed to do. Mm -hmm. So now at this point in time it's become critical to our ongoing operations and most of that money has been directed towards facility enhancements. Part of the, uh, the fundraising, about $80,000 according to the uh, story mm -hmm. from University Relations, was for that item number 40. Right. And that's a designated purpose. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, please. you know, we're, we're putting in the new, uh, as we talked about this summer, the new video boards. Um, we needed to replace both of our video boards at the Coliseum and at Lewis Field Stadium, which were old scoreboards that have been there since uh, the early 90s, you know. And so when we looked at replacing them, we had to decide between simply replacing them w similar to what they were or mm -hmm to go ahead and elevate to the video boards. Mm -hmm. So in the Gross Coliseum, we put up a, a four-sided video board, which is gonna have all kinds of capabilities of things that we don't even know how to do yet. Mm -hmm. But it's got a lot of ability to, a lot of fan interactive type things that we can do with it that'll really be a good addition for our, our atmosphere for, for basketball and volleyball matches and that type of thing. Um, so Verlin and Lane Fawnen still stepped forward um, very graciously to make that a reality for us and because uh, we talked about what it would cost just to replace the existing and what it would cost to enhance that to the video board structure and uh, they very generously made that a possibility for us so that part got taken care of and and we're really excited about that we're just still in the process of learning how to operate it and how to make it work and so we're getting through volleyball season now doing some neat things with it but a lot more to come as basketball arrives. Um, by the same token, we, so we went ahead and took the same uh, approach with football to not just replace the scoreboard but we'll go with a video board that will be able to show replays and live action if we want, do the kiss cam and all those type mm -hmm. of things that interact with the fans. And it's going to be an enormous, it will be about twice the size of our existing scoreboard that's out there now. But when I see these video boards at other places around the country, Sometimes they can be sitting there and they look kind of isolated and other ones have um, a structure surrounding them that kind of encloses them and aesthetically makes it look a little nicer. 
So we'd like to add a, a limestone structure to kind of encase this monster score video board, which we think will make it look more permanent, make it look uh, like it's not just standing out there on its own, mm -hmm. and enclose it a little bit. And that's what we uh, targeted item 40 for this year, which we were guess we were, our target was 100,000, and we've surpassed that 80,000 mark there. Um, to the tune of about 95000 now. Wow. But we've also mm -hmm. realized that it may cost more than 100000 That was just mm -hmm. a guess. So we're, we're still generating funding for that, really targeting up closer to 150000 now mm -hmm. that we'd like to generate that will make that structure the type of thing that we want to tie it into the limestone wall mm -hmm. that surrounds Lewis Field. So by going with a limestone structure, uh, around it, I think that'll really make it a very, very uh, visually appealing. And fans can still participate, can't they? They Curtis? can. I think you know, like so many of our projects, Mike, uh, the fundraising seems to never end. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to do more and more of these projects to upgrade our facilities. Sometimes replacing certain facilities, but sometimes just simply upgrading them. And it takes a lot of money to do that. We've been mm -hmm. very, very fortunate. Um, obviously, many of the upgrades we've done we could not do without the support of this community. You know uh, that uh, donation uh, can be uh, can be a significant donation. Can two hundred and fifty dollars, for bet. example. You bet. Any amount was was we'll take any amount, obviously. But um, we will recognize on the board on the limestone. We'll have a plate on there that will recognize everybody that was a part uh -huh. of making that a reality. So that'll be the how we'll recognize them. Will be uh, visually on the board itself. Mm -hmm. Um, as time goes on, then we'll make that, and that'll be installed. That video board's going to be put up here in, I think, December. Mm -hmm. You know, just after our football season's over, we don't know when that's going to be for sure. We got to wait and see how those playoffs go. But once the season ends, then um, that'll be installed, and then after the board itself is installed, then we'll start working on the, the limestone structure afterwards. So, yeah, it's an ongoing deal. Curtis, uh, when people ask. Why are those state-of-the-art facilities, regardless of whether it's a video board or the new uh, athletic complex or right. the new track, uh, uh, Alec Francis uh, right. facility there, uh, why is it important? Well, I, like so many other entities in town, um, whether we're recruiting doctors to our community or, or teachers or coaches or athletes, um, we're a little bit geographically challenged out here, and I think it's important Hayes has to have outstanding facilities to attract those people um, away from other places and, and to make this the destination that they want to go to because of something special. And I think facilities play a big role in the recruiting process, like I said, not just of student athletes, but it may be coaches, it might be instructors, but all these things play in to having the great facilities that we want to have uh, to enhance our university and this community. So. Um, I always look at it like we can't just be as good, we need to be better mm -hmm. in those areas and to the, the ability that we can. Um, it takes a lot to get there, but we have to keep striving to move forward or, or like I said, we're moving backwards. You know, we can't sit still, we have to keep moving everything forward and trying to improve upon them and I think that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, these video boards are the latest, the chair back seats at the, at the football stadium. It was another new project, and as you mentioned, uh, Alex Francis Track. Mm -hmm. You know, we're kind of trying to continually improve those things, and right now, uh, Gross Coliseum and Lewis Field have, have received some, uh, some nice upgrades. But we have to continue that. I think it's important in all the recruitment of the special people that we need to be successful. Well, and Curtis, the soccer complex, the track uh, and field, uh, complex now, yeah. just beautiful facilities yeah. and really instills not only a pride in the athletes who use it, coaches and, and the staff, right. but in the community, I think. I think there's no question about that. I think there, there's the recruiting piece of it, but there's also the day-to-day -day functionability of it, mm -hmm. like the indoor training facility. I mean, that's a great recruiting tool, sure but it also provides a great purpose on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of allowing the year-round training that we need. Same as you mentioned, the soccer facility and the, and the track facility. Not only are they great recruiting tools, but they serve a great function on a daily basis for our athletes to train in the top of the line uh, facility. Always a pleasure to visit. Fort Hayes State Athletic Director, Curtis Hamicky, our community connection.
Eagle Communications is the leader in advertising services. We take the guesswork out of marketing your business. From creating the message to managing the campaign, Eagle can make your business stand out. Meet customers where they shop. Take your business online with a digital campaign and showcase your products on TV and radio. Let me help you reach the people that matter most by targeting demographics and using platforms that are proven to make your business grow. Call today. Eagle Communications, our community connected. Hi, I'm Brandon Cooley, and I'm the Video Production Director at Eagle Marketing Solutions. We're a full-service production house. Service, to me, really is everything. I think it's very important that we show our clients that we really have their best interest in mind. Video is very engaging. It's really the best platform to tell your story. We pride ourselves on attention to detail, creative concepts, and fast turnaround. We're always working to find new ways to make our product better and to be able to just do what we can to help the client tell their story in the best way possible. Welcome to our Community Connection as we're back again with uh, Eagle Community Television and producer and editor of the series, Brandon Cooley. In our studios today with Forte State University Professor of Social Work, Dr. Patricia Levy, as we talk about uh, a conference she attended in England. Uh, human sustainability in the face of incidents of mass violence at the European International Conference on Sustainability, Energy, and the Environment. This took place last July in Brighton, England. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, begin, if we could, uh, we'll get to the conference in a moment, uh, Dr. Levy, but let's talk about social work overall, first of all. Tell me about areas of influence. How does social work impact our lives? Well, there are a lot of things in society that don't work, where there are gaps. So um, we have problems with employment, problems with poverty, problems, economic problems for elders, health care problems, um, children who have been abused or neglected who need, outs uh, who need placement outside of the home. And uh, basically, social workers see in a society what doesn't work, what the gaps that, the social gaps that we still need to determine if those are people's rights or if those are, in other words, people's privileges or if those are things that the public, uh, either locally or statewide or federally, can fill in. So social workers identify areas of problems and concerns, bring those to the forefront, and then mm -hmm. try to offer uh, solutions? Yes, well, it depends what level you work at. If you work at a macro level, which means like community-wide, state, or federal, um, there is an organization called the National Association of Social Workers that lobbies in Congress mm -hmm. for social justice issues. Then there is a, a micro level where we actually go in and do counseling and therapy um, and try to help. For instance, we have school social workers mm -hmm. who go in, which is lots of fun. <laughs> I did that at one point. And I like to work with teenagers. And uh, they have all kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes families have communication problems mm -hmm. um, between themselves and their children or between the couples. Sometimes crisis hits uh, in families such as divorce or death or some kind of health care issue. So what we do is we use a strengths perspective which is to go in rather than asking what's your problem, we go in and start where the client's at and try to find out what their strengths are in terms of their resiliency mm -hmm. and then work from there to help them gain empowerment to eventually reach a situation of stabilization. So social work can encompass the very one-on-one -on -one individual Mm -hmm. all the way to a n broader national picture then, That's Dr. That's right. Lenny. That's right. We also do group work, like support groups, 
uh, here in, the, in Hayes, you have the Center for Life Experience mm -hmm. under Ann Liker, and she runs uh, groups for healing hearts, people who have lost children. So sometimes you, our students learn group work skills, they learn individual, what we call micro skills, and I also teach a class on the macro uh, for community organization. And they also have uh, two classes in social welfare policy, which covers historically the development of social welfare policy in the United States up to the present times. So students can just about pick the area that is of most interest to them yes. and pursue that. Most of the students are interested in practice, individual practice, and many of them are motivated to help people, which brings them into social work, and many of them want to work with children. But we are getting more students who are interested in the healthcare field and who are interested in working with the elderly, with older adults. So I'm happy to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this conference now that occurred last July in Brighton, England. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the invitation to present come to you? Well, I do a lot of travel abroad, and I have grandchildren in Israel. And I saw the conference, and uh, you know, traveling from Israel to Europe is a lot cheaper and a lot easier. <laughs> than from here, uh, from the States over. And I've been going to international conferences for some years, mm -hmm. and I've also published uh, internationally. So when you go to international conferences, um, you hear viewpoints that you won't hear here. Mm -hmm. And the people come from different backgrounds and different education, and you hear what's going on globally so, for example, uh, poverty globally. How do different countries deal with that? How are different professionals dealing with that? Um, issues of disaster and terrorism uh, are affecting many countries globally. I myself, when I lived in Israel, uh, was a responder in social work. Uh, I worked through two wars and a terrorist attack. Uh, there and there are just many crisis skills that you learn about and programs that people have developed in other countries. And this has to cut across the so social, the economic, as well as the political areas then, right Dr. Lutley? Yes, uh, very definitely so because in different countries we define differently the issue of social responsibility. Uh, for example, um, uh, we have different ideas here about people who are uh, in poverty, and we give them temporary help. But for instance, in Israel and Western Europe and England, they have programs where, for instance, for children, where they have an emphasis on the children in their society, where they'll give a symbolic stipend mm -hmm. to families for the number of children that they have. It's symbolic, but it's kind of uh, what society's responsibility is. In some countries, they have most country, most Western countries, they have universal health care, mm -hmm. which is federally funded, and so um, it's not. It's not health care is not in the for profit sector. So the way they define social responsibility with health care is that everyone, it is the government's responsibility to provide at least basic health care for all of their citizens and also to ensure that births, maternity, and children will be born and be healthy to add to their society. Mm -hmm. And here you know, you have to be able to afford health care. And right now, the current administration cuts programs directly designed to help children become productive adults. It's all in the attitude and what your political ideology is. 
and then from that how you form your social and economic structures. It's very difficult when people's lives are in the hands of legislators because legislators may not really know what those realities are and there are a lot of stereotypes that are used for instance people taking advantage of the system or um, also in our country uh, with our capitalist system, we need to keep a level of the society as cheap labor so that the for-profit sector, it's capitalism, for-profit sector can, uh, you know, make a profit. But on the other hand, we say that people should have, uh, that you can work up the ladder if you really want to. And that's an issue of access. Can you access good education? Can you access good health care? Can you access a good job? So if you grow up in a family that's living in a neighborhood that has high quality schools and you get good teachers and all of the mediation and all of the equipment that you need, then there, you have a very good chance of being able to access those opportunities. But children who are being raised in poverty areas, particularly when we base, uh, in many areas of the country, we base schooling on property tax. Mm -hmm. Well, in poverty areas, they don't own much property. So how much tax money is going to go in to be invested in those schools with the equipment uh, to help those children? In other words, some children, we, populations of children and adults, we invest in more than we invest in other populations. Tell me a little, if you would, Dr. Levy, about uh, the conference itself and some of the highlights in the details of your presentation, would you? <laughs> um, the conference took place in Brighton, England, which was quite an experience because we had to get through from Heathrow down to Brighton, driving on the wrong side of the street <laughs> and going the wrong direction with the roundabouts. <sighs> and the GPS didn't work going down there, mm. which was really a story. But um, I gave mine, I have been, uh, because of my experiences in Israel, um, I have been, uh, I have an expertise in, on terrorism mm -hmm. and, um, and domestic terrorism. So um, I wanted to talk about resiliency, the issue of resiliency in the face of disaster and terrorism. It's kind of like this. If you have a bone, okay? This is out of an author's article. But if you have a bone and you put enough pressure on it, you might have a fracture. If the pressure continues, the bone might break. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people who have been through wars and disasters, they experience trauma. And people's resiliency are very important because even if they survive and they return to normal life, they still carry that fracture with them. And what is important is, uh, I was doing a research up at Fort Riley a few years ago. Um, they had asked myself and another co-researcher to develop a module on resiliency for soldiers who were being redeployed. And we were talking there because I also, having been in Israel, I had a son who was in the Israeli Defense Forces. We were talking about it's not whether or not you have post-traumatic uh, stress. What it is is to what extent do you have it and if it disrupts your, your functioning. So I talked about stress theory and trauma theory at the conference. And I brought in, a, uh, talked about incidents where what can people do, what coping strategies can people do depending on their personality traits and also depending on their history. Um, because they found that, the Rand Corporation found that three populations are the most vulnerable, for instance, in the military to have post-traumatic stress. One is women, 
One is minorities who face stress with discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. And the other is people who come from a history of having been abused, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is how do we bolster people's resiliency given that there are disasters and terrorism and war that are outside of our control? And how can we prepare the best to protect our populations so that, you know, you see what's happening with, um, I did a sabbatical in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and we see what happened with Irma and Harvey and, you know, Homeland Security and FEMA have gotten better and better at understanding the dynamics of disaster, but also we need to put more emphasis on what happens with the survivors immediately in terms of helping them to process what has happened to them. That's where you, were, like you might have social workers with the Red Cross. And then for long-term effects, because they are not necessarily mental health patients in the orthodox sense. If you don't have a reaction to trauma, that would be unusual, wouldn't it? <laughs> you fascinating, know, I, yeah. fascinating study. Professor of social work at Fort Hayes State University, and we certainly appreciate her expertise. Dr. Patricia Lovey, our community connection. For over 60 years, Eagle Communications has been the leader in value and service. And over that time, our specialized teams have been helping businesses grow because Eagle is your one stop for business solutions. We can provide the latest in hosted phone, reliable fiber internet, IT support, business compliance, and network planning. Plus, we offer affordable advertising on television, radio, and digital platforms. Call our employee owners today and let us serve you. Eagle Communications, our community connected.